Now open your question paper and look at part 1. Part 1. You will hear people talking in eight different situations. For questions 1 to 8, choose the best answer. A, B or C. Question 1. You hear a man talking to a friend about a bicycle shop. The bike shop I use is in Green Street, next to quite a nice cafe. Do you remember I told you about it? People often go there and have a coffee and a piece of cake while they're having their bike fixed. I know you'd like that. Yes, I would. Anyway, if you ever need to go after work, it isn't far from here. They have a good range of cycling equipment and the staff are very helpful. They also have maps of the local area with all the best routes for cyclists. OK, thanks. I do need to check a couple of things on my bike. The bike shop I use is in Green Street, next to quite a nice cafe. Do you remember I told you about it? People often go there and have a coffee and a piece of cake while they're having their bike fixed. I know you'd like that. Yes, I would. Anyway, if you ever need to go after work, it isn't far from here. They have a good range of cycling equipment and the staff are very helpful. They also have maps of the local area with all the best routes for cyclists. OK, thanks. I do need to check a couple of things on my bike. Question 2. You hear a TV producer talking about reality programmes on TV. Some of these reality programmes have enormous viewing figures. They're incredibly popular at the time. But there's a massive difference between the popularity of a game show or a reality show and something that's really going to stand the test of time, to leave a legacy. Don't get me wrong, reality shows entertain and they're well made, but quality drama series are in a different class. Viewers will be watching those reruns in 50 years' time, unlike the reality shows. You've got to look at the long game. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Some of these reality programmes have enormous viewing figures. They're incredibly popular at the time. But there's a massive difference between the popularity of a game show or a reality show and something that's really going to stand the test of time, to leave a legacy. Don't get me wrong, reality shows entertain and they're well made, but quality drama series are in a different class. Viewers will be watching those reruns in 50 years' time, unlike the reality shows. You've got to look at the long game. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Question 3. You hear two writers talking about writing dialogue. You have a wonderful ear for natural sounding dialogue in your novels. Where does that come from? Do you deliberately listen to other people's conversations? I don't consciously do that, but I think writing dialogue is like being able to draw. Some people can, some people can't. Spoken language is quite different from written language, so as a writer it's a very difficult thing to master. How to write down the language of speech so that it rings true. It certainly is interesting that so few writers can produce great dialogue instinctively. You have a wonderful ear for natural-sounding dialogue in your novels. Where does that come from? Do you deliberately listen to other people's conversations? I don't consciously do that, but I think writing dialogue is like being able to draw. Some people can, some people can't. Spoken language is quite different from written language, so as a writer it's a very difficult thing to master. How to write down the language of speech so that it rings true. It certainly is interesting that so few writers can produce great dialogue instinctively. Question 4. You hear a woman telling a friend about a long train journey she's been on. I really enjoyed that long train journey I did. Really? 
I'd be bored having to sit there and do nothing for eight hours. Mm, I didn't mind. I mean, you have to make sure you get up and walk around from time to time because there isn't too much leg room, especially if you're sitting by the window with another passenger next to you like I was. But what I liked about my seat was the fact that I could relax and think about nothing and really have time to appreciate all the stunning views. I did try to talk to the woman sitting next to me from time to time, but she mainly wanted to sleep. I really enjoyed that long train journey I did. Really? I'd be bored having to sit there and do nothing for eight hours. Mm, I didn't mind. I mean, you have to make sure you get up and walk around from time to time because there isn't too much leg room, especially if you're sitting by the window with another passenger next to you like I was. But what I liked about my seat was the fact that I could relax and think about nothing and really have time to appreciate all the stunning views. I did try to talk to the woman sitting next to me from time to time, but she mainly wanted to sleep. Question 5. You hear a man telling a friend about a holiday he's recently been on. Hi, Kevin. How was your holiday? Very relaxing, thanks. Did you book everything online? No, only the flights. I went to my local travel agent and they recommended the hotel. I couldn't have found a better deal myself. Was there plenty to see? I suppose I'd have been to more places if I'd taken a good guidebook, but I didn't feel the need to see everything there was to see. I know what you mean. So, where are the photos? I can show you some now, though unusually for me there aren't that many. I missed an opportunity there. Anyway, it was great fun. Hi, Kevin. How was your holiday? Very relaxing, thanks. Did you book everything online? No, only the flights. I went to my local travel agent and they recommended the hotel. I couldn't have found a better deal myself. Was there plenty to see? I suppose I'd have been to more places if I'd taken a good guidebook, but I didn't feel the need to see everything there was to see. I know what you mean. So, where are the photos? I can show you some now, though unusually for me there aren't that many. I missed an opportunity there. Anyway, it was great fun. Question 6. You hear a woman talking on the radio about the arts. It's always been one of my favourite books, and I've read it so many times that I've got a really clear picture of what the characters are like and so on. So when I heard they were adapting it for TV, I was a bit anxious and decided I wouldn't watch it in case it spoilt the book for me. Then I heard that money had been raised to adapt it for the big screen, and the author had written the screenplay. I watched it with my friend, who's also a fan, and we loved it, along with the rest of the audience. It's always been one of my favourite books, and I've read it so many times that I've got a really clear picture of what the characters are like and so on. So when I heard they were adapting it for TV, I was a bit anxious and decided I wouldn't watch it in case it spoilt the book for me. Then I heard that money had been raised to adapt it for the big screen, and the author had written the screenplay. I watched it with my friend, who's also a fan, and we loved it, along with the rest of the audience. Question 7. You hear two students discussing their college. Hi, Lucas. How's it going? OK, thanks. Though I guess it always takes a little while to get used to a new place. Yeah, I was surprised at the condition of some of the teaching rooms. Bigger windows and a fresh coat of paint would make a huge difference. Mm, I agree, and I've found it less than easy to actually get hold of some of the staff outside class times, which doesn't reflect well on them. But the football and hockey fields are well looked after. That isn't the case at a lot of colleges. I must say all my teachers are really approachable and have given me plenty of good advice. And also the gym's very well equipped, so I'm not complaining. Hi, Lucas. How's it going? OK, thanks. Though I guess it always takes a little while to get used to a new place. Yeah, I was surprised at the condition of some of the teaching rooms. 
bigger windows and a fresh coat of paint would make a huge difference. Mm, I agree, and I found it less than easy to actually get hold of some of the staff outside class times, which doesn't reflect well on them. But the football and hockey fields are well looked after. That isn't the case at a lot of colleges. I must say, all my teachers are really approachable and have given me plenty of good advice. And also, the gym's very well equipped, so I'm not complaining. Question eight. You hear a child psychologist talking about the impact of noise on very young children. Recent data from our laboratories suggests that very young children can recognize speech, but only when the environment is relatively quiet. If we as adults find a situation too noisy, we can do something about it. We can turn down the TV or radio or move to a quieter room. Babies can't do that. They depend on us to do it for them. But we're only likely to do this if the noise level is difficult for us too. We need to be much more aware of the impact that this noise might have on children and make a point of reducing it when we are interacting with our children. Recent data from our laboratories suggests that very young children can recognize speech, but only when the environment is relatively quiet. If we as adults find a situation too noisy, we can do something about it. We can turn down the TV or radio or move to a quieter room. Babies can't do that. They depend on us to do it for them. But we're only likely to do this if the noise level is difficult for us too. We need to be much more aware of the impact that this noise might have on children, and make a point of reducing it when we are interacting with our children. That is the end of part one. Now turn to part two. Part two. You will hear a woman called Jane Hughes. Talking about total solar eclipses, which happen when the moon comes between the sun and the earth and blocks out the light from the sun. For questions nine to eighteen, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have forty-five seconds to look at part two. Hello, my name's Jane Hughes, and I, like a number of people around the world, am fascinated by total solar eclipses. That's when the moon moves between the sun and the earth and blocks out the light from the sun for a short time. For years, I took absolutely no interest in eclipses and tended to skip any article on the subject I saw in the newspaper. It wasn't until I was taken to an exhibition that was absolutely fascinating and turned out to be all about them that I realized I'd actually like to witness one for myself. A total solar eclipse happens approximately every 18 months somewhere on Earth, and in order to see the full effect, you have to be in a particular place at a particular time. In the case of the first eclipse I went to watch, that place was in Australia. I took the cheapest flight I could find from London to Sydney, and then a train to a small town several hundred kilometers away. I rented a camper van to reach the spot where some other eclipse chasers, as people like me are commonly known, were gathering. Eclipses can happen at any time during daylight hours, and this one took place first thing in the morning. I'll never forget it. It can feel very strange when it suddenly goes dark at one o'clock on a sunny summer's afternoon. I felt a huge rush of emotion. I've had some memorable experiences in my life, like going on a night dive in Madagascar or finally managing to run a half marathon. But when it went dark for two long minutes, the closest this came to for me in terms of sheer excitement 
was when I once did a parachute jump. But don't just take my word for it. Go out and try it for yourselves if you ever get the opportunity. And just before the total eclipse, as well as just as it ends, there's a tiny flash of brilliant light, which astronomers call the diamond ring effect. We were just amazed and stood in complete silence. So then I was hooked and started planning how to see my next eclipse as soon as I got home. That one, my second, would prove to be even more of a challenge to watch. To get as much as three minutes of darkness during this total eclipse, the ideal location would be surrounded by open ocean, a small island, because seen from the nearest large landmass, the eclipse would be far shorter. However, that was easier said than done. A group of us had to travel for about six hours in a little boat, carrying all the food and water we'd need on board. However, the boat we'd hired had no fuel. And until the captain managed to find some, we thought we might not be able to reach our destination. It was an exciting trip across some quite rough water. And when we got there, I spread my sleeping bag on the sand. I was very grateful for the mosquito net I'd packed too, which I attached to a tree branch above my head. We went straight to sleep under the stars. Once again, it was completely magical. Of course, I realize not everyone can do this or would want to. You can look online for great photographs of eclipses as well as video clips and articles explaining the phenomenon. You might even come across a poem I wrote, my attempt to describe how it feels to witness these events. I'm already dreaming about my next trip. I must buy a tent to take with me. The one I have is far too heavy. I have special glasses so I can watch eclipses without damaging my eyes, and a solar filter for camera lenses is essential. That's all the special equipment I need. So, if uh, you'd like to ask anything, I'd be... Now you will hear part two again. Hello, my name's Jane Hughes, and I, like a number of people around the world, am fascinated by total solar eclipses. That's when the moon moves between the sun and the earth and blocks out the light from the sun for a short time. For years, I took absolutely no interest in eclipses and tended to skip any article on the subject I saw in the newspaper. It wasn't until I was taken to an exhibition that was absolutely fascinating and turned out to be all about them that I realized I'd actually like to witness one for myself. A total solar eclipse happens approximately every 18 months, somewhere on Earth. And in order to see the full effect, you have to be in a particular place at a particular time. In the case of the first eclipse I went to watch, that place was in Australia. I took the cheapest flight I could find from London to Sydney and then a train to a small town several hundred kilometers away. I rented a camper van to reach the spot where some other eclipse chasers, as people like me are commonly known, were gathering. Eclipses can happen at any time during daylight hours, and this one took place first thing in the morning. I'll never forget it. It can feel very strange when it suddenly goes dark at one o'clock on a sunny summer's afternoon. I felt a huge rush of emotion. I've had some memorable experiences in my life, like going on a night dive in Madagascar or finally managing to run a half marathon, but when it went dark for two long minutes, the closest this came to for me in terms of sheer excitement was when I once did a parachute jump. But don't just take my word for it. Go out and try it for yourselves if you ever get the opportunity. And just before the total eclipse, as well as just as it ends, there's a tiny flash of brilliant light, which astronomers call the diamond ring effect. We were just amazed and stood in complete silence. So then I was hooked and started planning how to see my next eclipse as soon as I got home. That one, my second, would prove to be even more of a challenge to watch. To get as much as three minutes of darkness during this total eclipse, the ideal location would be surrounded by open ocean, a small island, because seen from the nearest large landmass, the eclipse would be far shorter. However, that was easier said than done. A group of us had to travel for about six hours in a little boat, carrying all the food and water we'd need on board. 
However, the boat we'd hired had no fuel. And until the captain managed to find some, we thought we might not be able to reach our destination. It was an exciting trip across some quite rough water. And when we got there, I spread my sleeping bag on the sand. I was very grateful for the mosquito net I'd packed, too, which I attached to a tree branch above my head. We went straight to sleep under the stars. Once again, it was completely magical. Of course, I realize not everyone can do this or would want to. You can look online for great photographs of eclipses as well as video clips and articles explaining the phenomenon. You might even come across a poem I wrote, my attempt to describe how it feels to witness these events. I'm already dreaming about my next trip. I must buy a tent to take with me. The one I have is far too heavy. I have special glasses so I can watch eclipses without damaging my eyes, and a solar filter for camera lenses is essential. That's all the special equipment I need. So, if uh, you'd like to ask anything, I... That is the end of part two. Now turn to part three. Part three. You will hear five short extracts in which people are talking about walking to work. For questions 19 to 23, choose from the list A to H how each speaker says they benefit from walking to work. Use the letters only once. There are three extra letters which you do not need to use. You now have 30 seconds to look at part three. Speaker 1 Walking any distance is usually a planned leisure activity or some sort of health aid to help people lose weight or keep fit. But there's something else people get from choosing to walk. It's a space to think. After I'd opted to walk to work instead of taking the bus, I began to sense a sort of empathy and togetherness with the many workers who were doing the same thing every morning. And that's never gone away. I arrive at work in a more laid-back frame of mind, and colleagues say I seem much calmer. Speaker 2 There's a lot to look at. I'm always spotting strange little streets, interesting cafes, things I wouldn't have paid attention to if I'd driven or taken public transport. I'm lucky the distance between my home and office isn't that great, but there's enough variety to offer opportunities for a little urban exploration, and I can allow myself a certain flexibility, which is good. If I'm a bit stressed, I'll make sure I pass through a park or somewhere with some wildlife. It's amazing how a relatively small change to my routine has brought so many improvements to my life. Speaker 3 a lot of people see walking from place to place as time lost from their busy schedules. I used to feel like that and be entirely focused on work, which wasn't great. But in fact, building that extra time into my morning for walking to the office has actually allowed me to take in what's around me and gives me time. I found myself thinking about everything I've got and how fortunate I am. It's just as well that I've always eaten a big breakfast before I set off for work. And of course, the exercise does me good. Speaker 4 Although none of my colleagues have commented on the difference in how I look, I've been pleased with the change. I got fed up going to the gym in an effort to lose weight and build some muscles. I just couldn't face it after a day at my desk. So, I switched to walking to work. And now, I never feel bad about walking, even when it's a bit chilly. And whereas once I would have jumped on a bus, which would have been quicker, now I just enjoy the fresh air. Speaker 5 
I've been walking to work for months. I must know every road there is in the area between my flat and my office. Walking requires a certain amount of attention, but it leaves enough of the time open to thinking. I reckon once you get the blood flowing through the brain, it starts working faster and more creatively. It means by the time I get to the office, I can really focus on a task and get things done. I used to be like my colleagues, drinking coffee and feeling sleepy. I find I have brighter eyes and clearer skin too, despite all the invisible pollution in cities. Now you will hear part three again. Speaker one. Walking any distance is usually a planned leisure activity or some sort of health aid to help people lose weight or keep fit. But there's something else people get from choosing to walk. It's a space to think. After I'd opted to walk to work instead of taking the bus, I began to sense a sort of empathy and togetherness with the many workers who were doing the same thing every morning. And that's never gone away. I arrive at work in a more laid back frame of mind and colleagues say I seem much calmer. Speaker 2 There's a lot to look at. I'm always spotting strange little streets, interesting cafes, things I wouldn't have paid attention to if I'd driven or taken public transport. I'm lucky the distance between my home and office isn't that great, but there's enough variety to offer opportunities for a little urban exploration, and I can allow myself a certain flexibility, which is good. If I'm a bit stressed, I'll make sure I pass through a park or somewhere with some wildlife. It's amazing how a relatively small change to my routine has brought so many improvements to my life. Speaker 3 A lot of people see walking from place to place as time lost from their busy schedules. I used to feel like that and be entirely focused on work, which wasn't great. But in fact, building that extra time into my morning for walking to the office has actually allowed me to take in what's around me and gives me time. I found myself thinking about everything I've got and how fortunate I am. It's just as well that I've always eaten a big breakfast before I set off for work. And of course, the exercise does me good. Speaker 4 Although none of my colleagues have commented on the difference in how I look, I've been pleased with the change. I got fed up going to the gym in an effort to lose weight and build some muscles. I just couldn't face it after a day at my desk. So, I switched to walking to work. And now, I never feel bad about walking, even when it's a bit chilly. And whereas once, I would have jumped on a bus, which would have been quicker, now I just enjoy the fresh air. Speaker 5 I've been walking to work for months. I must know every road there is in the area between my flat and my office. Walking requires a certain amount of attention, but it leaves enough of the time open to thinking. I reckon once you get the blood flowing through the brain, it starts working faster and more creatively. It means by the time I get to the office, I can really focus on a task and get things done. I used to be like my colleagues, drinking coffee and feeling sleepy. I find I have brighter eyes and clearer skin too, despite all the invisible pollution in cities. That is the end of part three. Now turn to part four. Part four. You will hear an interview with a woman called Sarah Featherstone, who runs a website called Coffee Lovers. For questions 24 to 30, choose the best answer. A, B, or C. You now have one minute to look at part four.
Welcome to the program, Sarah. What gave you the idea for starting a website on coffee shops in the UK? Well, in most other European countries, there's a well-established coffee culture, but here in Britain, it started considerably later. There was a time when tourists had to search far and wide for a decent cup of coffee. In recent years, we've had a number of big international companies come in and put identical coffee shops in every city centre. But my website is about the small independent coffee shops. Their product is generally far superior, in my view, and they often struggle against the financial might of these big internationals. So I suppose I wanted to promote them. Now, tell us a bit about your coffee website. Well, in its current form, users are directed to a menu of different towns. That's a new development. Clicking on the one you want brings up a web page for each recommended coffee shop, where you can find a written review by us. Tons of photos, a map, and a link to a customer review page, which is starting to grow. And it's all paid for by external advertising, not by the coffee shops. Obviously, if coffee shops were allowed to advertise, that would be against the spirit of the website. As it's meant to be unbiased opinion, not somewhere for the shops to publicise themselves. So I imagine you must reject some of the coffee shops you visit. Yes, two out of every three usually don't make it onto the site. Last week we rejected a place where the seating and decor just weren't welcoming. With most places, the coffee itself is good. It's rare for it to be bad enough to put us off. More often, it would be the attitude of the staff that didn't please us for one reason or another when we visited. So, what did you write about the coffee shop we're in now, the Old Mill House? Well, we like very small coffee shops that have real character, and also an unusual and unique selling point for the public. The Old Mill House have always been great at this. It used to be their colourful plants and interesting paintings, but other shops soon copied them. Now it's the humorous messages they put up on their chalkboards, things like special offers, requests to visitors, and so on. Other places in the city have fantastic, unique ideas too, such as board games for customers to play. And we're going next to one called the Pink Peacock. Yes, at the Peacock, they've really set out to make the accompanying food their speciality. Their pies are nothing short of amazing, although they are a bit pricey. But what strikes you with a place so small is that they seem to be able to cater for every request. Gluten-free cakes, wheat-free bread, lactose-free milk. And they appear to do an excellent takeaway trade, so they're clearly very well organised and well supplied. So, Sarah, tell me a bit about why you set up your own business. Well, after leaving college, I got through quite a few part-time jobs, including a couple as a waitress. Then I worked as an administrator in a law firm. I was there for 10 years, until unfortunately I was made redundant. I decided to use my redundancy money to set up a business and after a lot of research and I guess thinking back to my earlier waitressing days, I thought about opening a coffee shop. Well, doing that seemed an easy way of losing all my money if I got it wrong. But the website, that idea seemed a better path to follow. And what plans do you have for your website in the future? Well, it's important to keep moving with it. The obvious thing is to start covering coffee shops abroad and to see whether that's popular. To limit it, I might just start off with capital cities in Europe. Longer term, I do intend to look into the possibility of an app, which would alert people to the nearest good coffee shop. Also, some kind of rating system, like using stars, is something I've been considering for ages. Although with that idea, I don't want to be seen to be copying other similar websites. Now you will hear part four again. Welcome to the programme, Sarah. What gave you the idea for starting a website on coffee shops in the UK? Well, in most other European countries, there's a well-established coffee culture, but here in Britain, it started considerably later. There was a time when tourists had to search far and wide for a decent cup of coffee. In recent years, we've had a number of big international companies come in and put identical coffee shops in every city centre. But my website is about the small independent coffee shops. Their product is generally far superior, in my view, 
and they often struggle against the financial might of these big internationals. So I suppose I wanted to promote them. Now, tell us a bit about your coffee website. Well, in its current form, users are directed to a menu of different towns. That's a new development. Clicking on the one you want brings up a web page for each recommended coffee shop where you can find a written review by us. Tons of photos, a map, and a link to a customer review page, which is starting to grow. And it's all paid for by external advertising, not by the coffee shops. Obviously, if coffee shops were allowed to advertise, that would be against the spirit of the website, as it's meant to be unbiased opinion, not somewhere for the shops to publicise themselves. So I imagine you must reject some of the coffee shops you visit? Yes, two out of every three usually don't make it onto the site. Last week we rejected a place where the seating and decor just weren't welcoming. With most places, the coffee itself is good. It's rare for it to be bad enough to put us off. More often, it would be the attitude of the staff that didn't please us for one reason or another when we visited. So what did you write about the coffee shop we're in now, the old mill house? Well, we like very small coffee shops that have real character and also an unusual and unique selling point for the public. The old mill house have always been great at this. It used to be their colourful plants and interesting paintings, but other shops soon copied them. Now it's the humorous messages they put up on their chalkboards, things like special offers, requests to visitors and so on. Other places in the city have fantastic unique ideas too, such as board games for customers to play. And we're going next to one called the Pink Peacock? <laughs> yes. At the Peacock, they've really set out to make the accompanying food their speciality. Their pies are nothing short of amazing, although they are a bit pricey. But what strikes you with a place so small is that they seem to be able to cater for every request. Gluten-free cakes, wheat-free bread, lactose-free milk. And they appear to do an excellent takeaway trade, so they're clearly very well organised and well supplied. So, Sarah, tell me a bit about why you set up your own business. Well, after leaving college, I got through quite a few part-time jobs, including a couple as a waitress. Then I worked as an administrator in a law firm. I was there for 10 years until, unfortunately, I was made redundant. I decided to use my redundancy money to set up a business and, after a lot of research and, I guess, thinking back to my earlier waitressing days, I thought about opening a coffee shop. Well, doing that seemed an easy way of losing all my money if I got it wrong. But the website, that idea seemed a better path to follow. And what plans do you have for your website in the future? Well, it's important to keep moving with it. The obvious thing is to start covering coffee shops abroad and to see whether that's popular. To limit it, I might just start off with capital cities in Europe. Longer term, I do intend to look into the possibility of an app, which would alert people to the nearest good coffee shop. Also, some kind of rating system, like using stars, is something I've been considering for ages. Although with that idea, I don't want to be seen to be copying other similar websites. That is the end of part four. There will now be a pause of five minutes for you to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. Be sure to follow the numbering of all the questions. I shall remind you when there is one minute left so that you are sure to finish in time. 